times have I read this gospel lesson? Hundreds, probably. Preached on it a minimum of 25 times. And this is the first time I noticed this when I read it this morning in the first service. Verse, uh, let's see, verse 6. No, that's not it. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. So was he a trick rider? <laughs> no one else has ever noticed that. I don't know what that means. That's, that's for further investigation. But it's just interesting. My point is how often we can read scripture and not notice the little details. Like, it sounds as if Jesus is writing two animals at once. But as I said, I'll have to look, that, look into that for next year and find out how that ended up that way. But this year, what I want to start with as we end in Palm Sunday, I'd like you to think about Jerusalem in the first century. And it's Passover and 200,000 people are coming into the city to celebrate the Passover. So imagine, if you will, two of them sort of being jostled to the side of the road by this ragtag parade of people waving palms and shouting, Hosanna, which means, save us. And the one man looks at the other and says, who is that? And of course, the other one responds, who is who? And the first speaker says, that man on the donkey. <coughs> Why are they shouting? Listen, Hosanna, save us. Why are they calling him the son of David? And the other man says, oh, I, I can't quite see him, but it must be that prophet, the one called Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And he said, you know, it's rumored, it's rumored that he returned to sight of a person who was born blind. And, listen to this, he brought back to life a man named Lazarus who had been in the grave, in the tomb, for four days. Some people say he's the Messiah. And the other man kind of cranes his neck and he sees Jesus as a calm, quiet man riding on a donkey and he says, Him? Him? The Messiah? You see, our two fictional characters and probably their real-life counterparts, had no expectations of Jesus. But plenty of people did. So much so that the writer of Matthew says that the city was in turmoil. Interesting that the actual translation for that is that the city was shaken. And the word, the Greek word for shaken, is our is the root of our English word for seismic. And so the message is that something ground-shaking, earth-shaking, is on the horizon. But of course, those who were in the crowd that day did not know that. Or if they thought that something earth-shaking was imminent, what happened was not what they had in mind. Because you see, they thought that the Messiah, if Jesus was that person, would be the one who would free them from the domination of Rome, would restore their homeland to them, and, and relieve them of the misery of their lives. So if someone had gone up to them and said, who is he? They would have said, he's the Messiah, the son of David. And that would have had very specific implications. 
In fact, the only time that anyone was welcomed with a palm was when they were a conquering hero who had returned to the city after freeing people from their enemies. So that's what they had in mind. And when Jesus was arrested later that week, they were so bitterly disappointed that their cries changed from Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, save us, Jesus, <coughs> to crucify him. There's a pastor whose first name is Stephanie, and last name is escaping me at the moment, so we'll just call her Pastor Stephanie who writes in the recent edition of Christian Century that, given human nature, <clears throat> we shouldn't be surprised at that switch of loyalty. In fact, she tells a story of her own, from all things in the world of baseball. She says that in 1985, she remembers it clearly, July 1st, 1985, she was at the stadium in Philadelphia, it is called, to see the Philadelphia Phillies play the Cubs, Chicago Cubs, right? Yeah, this is a dangerous illustration for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and onto the field, all of a sudden the whole crowd before the game started cheering and clapping and laughing because onto the field came a third baseman named Mike Schmidt. And he was wearing a funny wig and glasses because he was trying to alter the tone of the fans toward him. It seems that since 1983, when the, the Phillies lost the World Series due to something that Mike Schmidt did, which you don't know what that was, his popularity had begun to decline. And he had contributed to this tension with his own comments about the fans, so that this mood had developed and was about to explode in a negative way. So Mike Schmidt came onto the film with this, this funny wig and glasses, and everyone loved it, and they laughed, and they clapped, and they cheered for him. And it seemed as if maybe a more positive feeling was developed until the ninth inning. In the ninth inning, that's the, the last one. Right? Yeah. <laughs> In the ninth inning, Mike Schmidt was up. I guess it must have been the bottom of the ninth. Oh gosh, this is so fun to talk about something you don't know anything about. In the bottom of the ninth, Mike Schmidt got up. With two on and two outs. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and guess what happened? Struck out. Struck out. And the whole crowd did what? Boo. Boo. <laughs> crowd. And Pastor Stephanie said she joined right in. Boo! Boo! <laughs> and then she says, what caused that, that formally cheering, you know, supportive, joyous crowd in a matter of just a few hours into a heckling mob? And what caused the people in Jerusalem to be transformed from celebrating, shouting, Hosanna, save us, Jesus, calling for his murder in just a few short days. It's exactly the same thing. Mike Schmidt did not meet his fans' expectations. And either did Jesus. And Pastor Stephanie points out that a primary focus of what we call the Passion Narrative, the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem and what happened until the day that he was raised from the dead. A 
primary focus is that God does not save us in the ways that we might expect. So that God overpowers not with violence, but with love. God wins not with not with strength, but with sacrifice. God overcomes not with accolades, but with suffering. And so during Holy Week, we are going to be looking for the ways that God saves unexpectedly. And we're going to be joining the question of today's gospel lesson. Who is this? Or, more specifically, who is he? Who is Jesus? Now, today we celebrated First Communion. The children were at the first service. Yesterday we gathered to, to talk with them about the sacrament and we baked bread. And I find that as the years pass, the thing that the children often remember about first communion class is baking bread. But there's one more thing that I want them to remember. It is in that very same bread they bake with their hands when we bring it among the people of God and we share this feast together and we, we pray together, Jesus is present in that bread. Jesus is the one who forgives us and who strengthens us as we receive it. That's who Jesus is for those children and for all of us. So I ask you again, who is Jesus for you? This must be a baseball theme day because in the same, or same edition of Christian uh, Century that I ran across the, the earlier illustration, I ran across a man named Matt Fitzgerald who said that to him, Jesus was like a batter laying down a sacrifice butt. I may need your help on this one, uh, Mr. Baseball player back there, Alex. That I'm really, just, that just, I'm going in difficult territory here. Jesus is like a batter that lays down a sacrifice butt. Okay, theoretically, that particular batter could, in the right circumstances, hit a home run. Theoretically. But in that circumstance, the batter's job is to do what? Bring the runner home. Is that correct? That batter's job is to be bring the runner home. Now that batter doesn't want to be tagged out at first. He's going to do everything in his power not to be tagged out at first. But <coughs> in obedience of the coach or the manager and for the sake of the runner, to bring the runner home, that batter is going to lay aside his home run hitting abilities and do what? But, which means that he probably will be put out at first. So he's going to sacrifice, right, for the sake of of giving the runner home. He's going to suffer for the sake of the team. Now, if that didn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to delve too deeply into the analogy because it just barely makes sense to me. <laughs> but what I do want to ask is again, if Jesus is not like the batter who lays down the sacrifice bunt for you, who is he? And is he not meeting your expectations? And if that's the case, are you able to open your eyes to see how he might be at work in your lives in unexpected ways?
<coughs> and then come on Thursday and Friday and next Sunday. And we'll see how it is that God saves in ways that we might not expect. And we'll see that that's a good thing.